family for tax. This Filipino came along with three cans of milk. I, I think it's where it would stop. Yeah. And uh, he wanted to sell them. I don't know how much, because we didn't have any money. So I um, finally decided I'd take either one or two cans. I forgot which. I had a bowl old knife, which is about 18 inches, two foot long, sticking in the ground up, where he got a hold of it. He jerked that out of the ground when I told him I was going to keep his, some of his milk. I had one of my friends was sick. He had diarrhea, dysentery. And I went down. He grabbed that, and I grabbed my 45. And I told him, I said, I'm keeping this. My, my friend here has got the, either diarrhea or dysentery. I don't know which. But we were pretty much didn't have any food. Rice. Did the Japanese have you under siege? No. Or? no. We didn't have any food. We had watery rice twice a day. You don't live too long on that. And where that's were, all. Where were the army rations? What happened to them? Well, we didn't have any rations. We, we had run out of rations. We used to hunt. Once in a while, we could find a carabao, and they'd kill a carabao. What's that? Water buffalo. Mm. But uh, a water buffalo, the meat is, um, well, it's muddy because they lay in the water all the time or as much as they can. But uh, a young one is a little different. There's another kind of a cow over there. It's yellow. Got a little hump on the shoulders. Now their meat wasn't so bad, but you have you only way we could cook that meat that that was care about was boil it. Well, you had to pour that water off and then start over again, and you had to do that two or three times to get that mud uh, taste out of it. Then you didn't have much to eat after you did that. See, it'd be pretty dry. But it was better than nothing. And when we surrendered, our our generals met the Japanese. I forgot just where it was. Where they surrendered. The, uh, that was the first first time I think uh, the whole. All of an army surrendered at the same time. That was just on Baton. The Crigador sits out there about three or four miles in the bay, and they didn't surrender until a month, almost a month later. But that time we had got into our prison, see. Uh, they first taken me to Camp O'Donnell. And uh, there was, I don't know how many there were on the north side of the road, but on the south side of the road was Filipinos that had surrendered. We, our boys were dying about 17, 18 a day at that time. Was this after the march? Yeah. Tell me, the Battle of Bataan, um, how did the battle go, the actual battle for Bataan and the Japanese and Americans? Well, we had no airplanes, and our artillery was, was wore out. And those large, those large guns uh, seemed like we had, I don't know whether we had 105 or 155. Every so often, you got to take the rifles out and put in a new one. Well, those have done wore out, and they just, them shells come out of there sideways almost, seem like. Well, they, uh, they hit us with uh, cavalry. They had horses and mules. They had 
got a lot of them in China because they had long, the hair on them was real long. So they used those to carry their equipment. And those jabs, they had bicycle brigades. There'd be one man on a bicycle up here with a machine gun on his back, barrel sticking straight up. Then the one behind him, he operated it. You know, when it comes to, they had to come to combat, they just lay those uh, bicycles down and up one and lay down on his belly or uh, down on his hunkers and get his head down and the one behind him would grab the machine gun. They came down the road at one time and we had uh, our tanks bivouac right, or camouflage right alongside the road. And when things got just right, they opened up the machine guns on the bicycle brigade and cranked them tanks up and right down the road, run over them, anything. They're, they just, well, that's the only way you can do it, kill them. they but they had us outnumbered. The main thing, our boys didn't have any food. You cannot fight. How you can't you, do nothing. How come you didn't have any food? Had you run out of rations? Or yeah, we had run out of rations. How long were you on the Badan Peninsula? I think about three months. Because we surrendered the ninth day of April. 1943. 43? 1942, that's it. Um, did you know that you were going to surrender, the Americans were going to surrender? Not until uh, the, uh, no, the night, uh, they, somebody came there and told us that uh, we had surrendered. And was to get in our trucks, but we'd met at a place. Our whole, our battalion, congregated in one place, and somewhere or other, we still had a few of our cavalry left, horses and mules, and they butchered both. They butchered the horses and the mules, and we, that's what we had to eat. Well, that was pretty good for what we. We didn't have nothing before. Then they told us to go to Mar Valis, that's the southern tip of the peninsula. You couldn't have got any farther from prison than Mar Valis. But you went over to Crigador and you'd have to swim through the sharks to get over there. But we walked, we marched from Mar Valis. They said, we thought we was going to get to ride out in our trucks. We had trucks and had gas in them. They made us walk. So we didn't have any guards for them. Well, that, that morning they sent us out. We didn't have any Jap guards for that day or that night until about the next day. Okay, where were you marching to? Well, there's only one road to march on to get out of there. Okay, you're marching off the Tam Peninsula. Yeah, but that's, uh, okay. if you go up the east side of it, that's uh, uh, the east side of the peninsula. And we finally wound up in San Fernando. How far is that? It's approximately 70, 75 miles out. Tell me exactly what happened. What did you do on the march? Describe it. Well, I got the... Uh, one or so rice ball, about like that. The Japs had made up a rice ball and gave it to us one time. There. Now, all I can tell you is just where, where I was. Uh, I hear a lot of stories, and I, and I think they're all right. They, uh, 
we crossed uh, a small runway down there on Baton, and those, the, our planes, when they used that, we had a few little old two-wing planes. Uh, they parked up here in the jungle someplace, and they'd go right out over to Manila Bay. Manila was back over there about 30 miles, I think it was, 28. And when we crossed that thing, the Japs had artillery set up right down the middle of that runway. And when I crossed there, Corregidor set fire to them. They started on the far end, the west end of that. I mean, they didn't miss their mark. They hit those guns. They had sandbags around them. But they didn't miss their mark. They blowed wheels, gaps, and guns. They picked them off. Started and picked them off right down that line. Well, of course, we got we got to moving out of there pretty fast, you know. Didn't want to get in that shrapnel. But that, when I crossed there, they hit the about the first first one or second one on the west end. And uh, the other boys told me that they finished them all when they come across later on. See. Water, <laughs> water was a. Uh, Something else. I think our government, the United States government, went over there, now how many years ago, I don't know, and drilled wells. And they were artesian. Some of them didn't uh, have too much uh, flow, and some a little bigger. But drinking water. There was an irrigation ditch. Some of them boys, I think, drank some of that water in that thing. Well, I didn't drink anything like that. The only thing I used that water for was from a towel that was over my head. It was so hot. So, we finally got to San Fernando. Then from there, we went uh, by a freight train put us in those boxcars, but they did, on the train I was on, leave the doors open. Because I sat right in the door. You couldn't dare to get out. And it's so hot in a boxcar. And they closed the doors on some of them. But I heard an old man in that box the car that I was in, boy, he was hollering for help. But you didn't get any help. He needed air, that's what he needed. Because I wouldn't have gave him my seat, because, well, I didn't know him. The only guy, I tell you what, you've got to have, a, in those deals, you probably don't understand, nobody understands this. You've got to have a friend, and I'll tell you, he's got to be a good one to live through something like that. And I had a good one. We helped each other. I've heard this there wasn't a death march of the Japanese killing the Americans and all this. Did that happen? <laughs> well, on that march, I saw one American. He had been in one of those Philippine shacks and looked like he had came out of that shack and they were built up off of the, their own post, you know, over in that country. And it looked like he had came out of there and fell right out there in the in the yard. And he I don't know how long he'd been there, but you could see where he he had dug with his hands in that hard ground. I don't know how he could dig in that his dry dry season over there and it hadn't rained for three or four months. So I saw a Jap shoot him. Which I think he did him a favor, really because they wouldn't uh, pick him up. And one boy, I'd say a boy, he was a young lad, and I don't know whether he was a soldier or a civilian, but he was a white boy. They, we were getting, we were at a, a place where it had an artesian well, but it had a Quonset hut. And that's where they kept us. 
And this boy went out there to get some water, and our water line reached for a couple, three hundred yards. And there was a Jap standing there with his rifle and his bayonet on him. Well, this kid, I think, mentally, he was just wasn't right. But uh, but he knew what was going to happen. That Jap, of course, we couldn't understand Jap Japanese. And they couldn't understand us, or they didn't want to. And the officers was sitting over there in the shade of that building. And that Jap guard went over there, and they jabbered a little bit. They took that boy across the road. He didn't come back. So I'll figure out what happened. Because they, the Japanese didn't care anymore about, well, <laughs> about us, and they did their own soldiers. They killed their own. Boy, they're, uh, I've seen them beat, uh, beat their own soldiers for robbing, or some of, uh, some of us boys, we were working for them. And we was in a building, and I happened to be standing right in the door. What happened, there was two or three boys, we could make a little money selling tires to the Filipino, make five, six, seven pesos, and what we used that money for was to buy whiskey. And that whiskey wasn't to, wasn't to get drunk on, it was medicine. We brought one old boy back by pouring the whiskey to him. He had malaria every other day. He'd be down with malaria and chilling, and boy, we'd pour the, give him a big drink of that wrap him up. Pretty soon he'd start perspiring, snap out of it. He'd be all right the next day, then the next day down again. But he came home. He's dead now, I understand that. So, uh, but I've heard all the stories that if a man fell out of the death march, the Japanese shot him on the spot. Well, I wish I'd have brought a magazine down here, but we brought, a, me and my buddy brought friend of ours. He lives in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. He fell out one day on that march off the side of the road under a tree where it gets some shade, see. And my buddy, Bland Moore, he lives in Florida now, saw him. And he said, oh, there's Vanderbilt. And he went out there and got him. Picked him up and he slapped him, I'll tell you. He was crying. If we'd have left him there, he'd have still been there, and the Japs would have killed him. But we drug him into the next place where the Japs put us up. I forgot where it was. And you know, that boy still lied. He never mentioned that, about Bland Moore working him over that day. He never had, I've been over there twice in Kentucky, and I always go see him. So the last time that I was there, I said, you remember when we picked you up on the death march, don't you? Yeah. I said, you remember when Bland Moore slapped the water out of you too, don't you? Well, yes. <laughs> he never would mention that. Hadn't him. He still been there. Yeah, that he killed him. How many men died of the death march? I don't know. Right after the death march is when they went to die. We had one officer, and I forgot his name. We were in San Fernando. They put us in a arena where they had cockfights. And he made it just in the gate and sat down and died. He's one of our officers. He was a major. Like that, and I don't I don't remember his name. My, my buddy in Kentucky knows him. I don't know what it is. I forgot his name. But, uh, right after. But coming out of the town, that irrigation ditch along here, them boys drank that water. I didn't drink it. But we got up there a ways, and pretty soon there lay three Filipinos in there, dead ones. Jackson killed them. And there they laid in that uh, 
enough water. And uh, back down the road a ways, I saw one woman, Philippine woman. I don't know, but I think she had was pregnant. They ripped her, they cut her head off. Her head was laying here and her body here. And there was her little baby laying there. They killed it too. Some of them damn jabs. She probably wanting to help some of her friends, you know, the Filipinos had gone by or something, but there she lay. So I don't have much use for that yellow race. I don't care. When the men started dying, what were they dying from? Dysentery, diarrhea, and malaria. That dysentery kid did, malaria kid did. But uh, I know we found one of our friends in our same company. And there he laid on the, in one of those barracks on the ground. And we got him out of there, and Bland Moore gave him a bath, and I washed his clothes. And his clothes was terrible. And I washed his clothes, and you know, he said, I feel better than I've felt in a long time. I think either the next day or the next day he died. He's so poor, he's a big man. He was so poor then. What was, to death. what was prison life like in San Fernando? Well, <coughs> got a job driving trucks for the Japs. They couldn't understand English and we couldn't understand Japanese, but you learn Japanese pretty fast. Uh, they really didn't give us any beatings, or not me. Now, Bland Moore, they finally hung him by his, I don't know whether it was his toes or his house was, or his ankles hung him upside down in a, in a school. But that's after I left that job. I worked for the Japs eight months and I was swallowed up. I don't know whether it was malaria or, I don't know what it was. My legs would be the same size straight out of my ankle. So I accidentally got to go into Bellabed Prison. That's the old federal penitentiary. Been there for a million years, I suppose. They're way, way back. Uh, and uh, as I went in, I saw a Red Cross ship sitting out in the bay. So they had uh, dried food, food and uh, Red Cross boxes, American, which doesn't amount to too much. They're not, nothing like national. Now, I, well, I'll come back to this. They had sulfur drugs and quinine, see. They were dying, they were dying a hundred, a hundred or over a day at Cabana de Juan Prison. That's out northeast of Manila. They got that uh, quinine and that sulfur drugs and that some food. Never lost a man for a week, finding one day. Dysentery. Well, you know what dysentery is. And that malaria kid, you too. Sure will. When you were driving the truck to the Japanese, what were you calling? What were you? That's uh, our um, American equipment that we'd had down in Baton, the trucks, tanks, the uh, artillery, shells. Well, you know, there's a lot of equipment goes to, besides our government equipment, the civilian equipment. You know, the civilians move down in there, too. So that's what we was hauling out of there. Tires. I've hauled out tires. I tried to sell one when I could to a Filipino to get a hold of a few pesos. How did you have backups to the Filipinos? Oh, they're long roads. 
And then we didn't have the Japs in all of our trucks. They had Jap guards. Some of them was mean. It was a, uh, we got, I finally got a hold of a, a Lowry truck. That's English. And the tires was about that high on it. And they are rough right. And them Japs wouldn't ride with it. They'd stand up, you know, in the back. They wouldn't ride in that old rough truck. Well, that suited us fine. Give us a little time to do a little <laughs> selling. Sell some of their old tires or something. I always try to find us a tire cell or two. Where did you live in San Fernando? What? Lived in a, I think it was an officer's uh, club or, well, you couldn't tell really what it was because it was uh, this large, pretty large room. But there were some little rooms back in the south end of it, which I know that's where they put them when they was going to die. Them old boys get that uh, malaria, and you'd hear them for a couple of days. We'd be out working and then come in. They'd be a groaning and a hollering back there, and come in then. No noise, but you know, well, got another one. We only lost, I think, 17. 18 boys out of uh, 100. Didn't lose too many. Oh, your meal was like in prison. Well, it was, a, it's a courting. Uh, when I worked for the Japs, we of course had rice. And at that time, we could buy uh, this round, uh, oval-shaped uh, salmon or yeah, sardines. Sardines, I guess they were. Well, you could put that on your rice, see, and give it a little taste. And we did all right out of working for them. But what we could make out. <laughs> Them Filipinos, and then when we hauled that stuff, we'd haul it from Baton, all over Baton up to San Fernando, and that's where we lived. Then, after we got a whole mess of that stuff there, we hauled it from San Fernando to Manila. And they had a kind of a compressing outfit out there to press those old trucks, smash them together, you know, they, want, they wanted that scrap on Big deal. Now I'll tell you about the Red Cross. During the war, the uh, Japanese came in behind our our lines, about uh, some some kind of old time. We had little boys up here in this mountain went right out like that. And this point, and that's where they set in with their. They had a. I was up there once. They had a thirty-seven millimeter. We didn't have too much artillery. But they had 50 caliber machine guns. Here come these boats, landing barges around the bend at night. Well, they didn't make it to shore. Only the ones that floated in, they killed every damn one of them. In 1923, if I re remember right, they had a famine in Japan. They, millions of them died. I don't know, you've probably read about it here. Some of those Red Cross boxes was dated 1920, if I remember right, 22. 1922 was the date on them. Them Japs kept them all those years. Of course, that's only 20 years, 17 or 18. I haven't got any use for the damn yellow race. They're all just like. So these boats that were landing, were they Red Cross boats? No, 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 no. hell no, they were Japs. Oh, Japs. Yeah. Jap soldiers. Yeah. What was your then, average? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask, what was your average day in prison like? Well, we worked. 
We worked on a farm in the, in the Philippines. We I don't know how many acres we had there. We we irrigated it with the buckets. We packed the water and and we had to go barefoot it. And that volcanic ash is pretty sharp. And the calluses on my feet was pretty thick. They finally get calloused, you know, the way you can stand it. The, we had uh, two, I believe two boys escaped when I was in Cabana to one. They had us in the groups of ten. One escaped to kill the other nine. That was their theory. Two boys out of the same birth that I was in escaped. And that God, they had us out at the main gate, all of us in that barracks. We didn't care. We didn't care. The other pedic killed us. We didn't care. We just one of those things. But you know, they finally uh, decided it was the Japanese fault that they escaped. Don't you believe they had us out there over 45 minutes or an hour. We didn't know what they were going to do. We didn't even know what the score was. They catch those two that escaped? I don't know. I don't think so. Now, you say if one escaped, they killed the other nine. So they yeah. had you in groups of ten? That's the group of ten. I don't know for sure. I don't think I was in that group, you know, of ten. And there's a They had that in a lot of their detail. They, on a, they had a bridge crew up there on one of those rivers north of, I don't know, it's up north of Manila or someplace. And an old boy escaped there, and he and I know the other nine, one of them, But well, two of them were brothers, not in the same tent. And one of them saw his brother lined up. They shot the knife and one escaped and they killed the other nine. Right in front of them. Have them to watch. They, that's their greatest ordeal is so, so you will see it. Sons of bitches. Then I went to uh, Japan. I was up there 23 months. Went up there in 43. Went by boat? Yeah. You, All said, you say a lot of those Japanese boats were sunk by the Americans? Yeah. A lot of American prisoners were killed? And they, uh, now I don't know anything about the Navy. <coughs> but there was a couple old Navy boys didn't tell us anything about that till the next morning. He said they, uh, what do you call it, sonar? That boat, that night, the one we were on, they never go to sleep. The Navy boys, see, they heard it when it hit the side of the ship and then echoes back. They sprayed to it, sprayed to it because they're right. And they thought, well, if they're given well, so many minutes, and if they don't put a torpedo in them, maybe they'll leave them alone. And sure enough. There was a quite a convoy scattered around. What, what did you do in Japan? Worked in a steel mill. Where'd you land? What part of Japan? I don't know. On the, on the, the main island, but you know, that island runs off back in south and west over there someplace. I think we got off on one little island, then we went by train through a tunnel over on the main island up to uh, <coughs> Hirohara. And they they almost starved us to death there. I weighed 118 and 8 tenths pounds, Japanese weight. They wouldn't let us see the. They had those scales with them. They they weighed by kilos. 
54 kilo, that's 118 eight tenths pounds. That's my weight. And I weighed that all. They weighed us every month. I don't get how deep the snow was, how cold it was. You better be naked. And they weighed you. You can kill all that. In the prison, there was no rest. You first went up there, we got a day off a week. But they always had something for us to do. Forced blankets. There, there was no rest. You know, you wanted to, you work in the steel mill where they unload iron ore and coal. Then the, another end of it, the slag, that's the rock uh, after the iron's taken out, out of iron ore, just in these big round uh, pots on a train. And they'd pull that out to the east end of the of the mill and they'd pour that. It's red hot. They'd pour it in a trench. And then we cooled it off with water and took baskets about that wide and open on one end. <clears throat> Load that stuff back in these baskets and walk a plank. Load it back in these cars. And another little railroad, you know, with it. And it was terrible at one time. We had a one of the honchos out there. I think he's originally from the Philippines, and he hated the Americans. I think he drove a Kalisa buggy. And you know what a bunch of soldiers and trucking soldiers and what have you, he, he didn't like them. And it was terrible. He worked the socks off it. And finally, I don't know how long that he was there, they finally took him in the service, I think. The, uh, you know, they tell you, the Japanese, uh, they want to die for their country. Run on to one Jap in the Philippines. He, he'd always ride with Bland Moore and me. And he learned to talk a little English. And he got to telling us about his school days. Just like it is here, you know, you play hooky, go to the pool hall. He'd tell that, you know, and laugh about it. But one day he came out, and he was just about to cry. He, so we asked him what is wrong. He says, I go, and I'll come back. He had to go in combat, so he knew he'd get killed. He probably laying over there someplace. Um, what kind of prison were you in over there in Japan? Well, we had uh, two barracks, and we had a fence around it, and they had bamboo uh, strips about so wide and sharpened on one end and nailed kind of like that. I got a picture of it at home. I got a picture taken in 1942. I'm in it at uh, Camp O'Donnell at mealtime. There's two in there. There's me and another old kid from Kentucky. That's the only two pictures I recognize. I mean, I know. There's a lot. I've got pictures up there, boys. That I've seen them. I don't know how many times. But I don't know. I don't. I just don't remember their names. I may have known them at one time. I don't know. How? What was the Japanese civilians' reaction to you 
you all when you were brought to Japan? When we were taken to Japan, they was all, uh, what did they say, bonsai? Is that victory? Seems like that's what it is. They're women and children at the mill. The steel mill where we went in, the, there's women and children there. I forgot whether they had little flags or what it was, but bonsai, I believe that's victory, if I remember that. Right. Uh, but the civilians, they didn't bother us. They, I worked with uh, women, two or three old women, quite a bit of time when I was up there. And, uh, when we, when the Japs surrendered, I'll tell you what, Can't think now. Hirohara, Hirohara, Japan. That, that was a town about six miles east of it. They started bombing that town at 10 o'clock at night, the market. And they didn't quit until four. One bunch right after the other. They was using incendiary bombs. Because we, they're a little old curtains, you know, they're made out of bamboo, you know, we could pry that apart and see it when they drop them things. They bombed them for six hours. <coughs> then they got us out at four o'clock in the morning and counted us to see if anybody escaped. Where were you going? One white man and a million Japs. So that town was burning, but you know what? Right here is a volcanic, right at the north edge of that town, a volcanic uh, mountain. It's up there pretty high. And right on top of that was either a shrine or a, I don't know what it was, <laughs> but I do know what is on the bottom. There's a black top road out here and right in here trees all grown up like this and I went over there me and two or three more we was going to I wanted to go up on that I want to see what that was up there boy I looked down in there under those trees and they that was an army camp they never touched it when they bombed But boy, I'll tell you, from that road on, they burned that town. We were about, I'd say, 12, 15 miles from Nagasaki. Now, I didn't uh, hear the bomb. The only thing I saw is sort of a, well, they're not mountains, and yet they're, it runs around to the north of us and then southwest. <clears throat> the only thing I could see was the uh, glare, the red glare in the sky of the town burning. Now, I didn't see the, any part of the bomb. Did you know what it was? No. One bomb. We knew that. How'd you find out? I guess the Japs. We had two or three Japs out on the job. If, if they told you something, you could just barely well believe it. And sure enough, uh, in August, August the 14th or 15th, I don't know which it was, that's when we came in off our job, we had a railroad or an urban line or electric train deal. We'd come over there and there was a little building here and they had this little speaker up on a post. I don't know, there's 15, 20 Japs standing down there and listening to that radio, I think that's what it was. If I couldn't understand their lingo. So we kind of thought maybe that that there's other boys that came in off the job at work, them old, them, them Jap guards tell them something, they, they told them it's all over. So next morning, 
because we didn't know. Next morning we get up, we had to wear wrapped leggings in, in August. <laughs> they run, they, that's pretty good. And we even had our food, our little dish of rice, ready to go to work. And our sergeant came in and said, take your rice to the galley. No work today. I slept. I slept about two or three days, day and night. They'd lay in every place. We'd give out, see. Then um, the first meal I got, I went off down the road there about a quarter of a mile. There was a Jap burial looking for eggs. A Jap what? A Jap burial. Oh. That's how. Oh, usually they're just a long building with maybe one room here and then a petition. That's the way they live. So I didn't know how to say eggs in Japanese because we never had had any. So I went around behind what we'd call an alley. And I was walking up that thing and I run onto a chicken coop. About like that, square. It had four hens in it. Three eggs. You know what happened to them eggs. I crawled in there and got those eggs. And I wondered and wondered, how come I didn't steal an old hen? I thought about that. But I got those three. So I went around in front of this burial, and there was an old Jap woman there, and I, uh, I didn't know how, I said sobbage, and she had one egg. I guess she gave that to me. So I had four eggs. Now how am I gonna cook them? Well, they cook our rice with uh, Coke. Then they, the way they, the Japanese uh, taught them that you don't make a soup out of it, rice, it's uh, steamed. You cook it so long and take the fire out and you got a big lid that you put over those pots that holds that in there and leave that in there for a while and they throw that out, the ashes out against the, uh, our bathroom uh, where we took bath. And it's concrete that's about so far. Well, they could lay that down there and the ashes. I found me a little old pot, some place. Pot or a can. Anyhow, I got filled out of water, put those four eggs in it. I braided it in that in ashes. Now I thought I had to do that fast, see, before somebody see me, because they'd steal them. Well, they just as hungry as I was. But we had eggs for breakfast, Friday. I went out there and my eggs are there, boiled, just fine. I eat those and I eat 10 fried ones. I eat 14 eggs for breakfast. Did you know the war was over? Yeah. But they still, uh, a little later on, then the Jap or Americans bombers came over with with uh, food. Just boiled, unloaded. What was your average day like in that prison camp in Japan? Work. What time do you get up in the morning? I don't know. Nobody had a watch. But daylight? Before daylight? Seems like it. And you worked till sundown? No. Seems like we put in about seven, seven hours most of the time. It's according to what we were working at. We done unloaded ships. They'd keep you there, you know, just as long as they could. Just, and whether it's seven hours, eight hours, or what it was. And I've been knocked down. You said, you know, you don't un maybe never work ships. You, they have unload that with cranes, you know, put those buckets down. Now, what do you unload? Iron ore. Iron ore. Okay. So. And you load that with square point shovel. That's heavy. Iron. We'd have four or five, uh, usually five, buckets 
in the hole of that ship. And them Japs are so dumb, they couldn't understand what we had. We had four boys or five, I believe they put five to a bucket. And, and them, old, them five boys down here would be big boys, see, the first ones. They worked like thunder to load that. So then they'd work like heck for the second one. All right, somebody somewhere in those five buckets is going to be behind. Because you can't pull this down, 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 just keep that up. But somebody's going to be behind, and we, and we were just poor snakes. Boy, you get back after that next shovel for a while. I'll tell you. Where was the iron ore coming from? I don't know. Come in in ships. I don't know where it came from China. I don't know. I don't know where they get there. Mm -hmm. Oh. What was your food in the prison camp there in Japan? Rice, very little. And uh, we usually got a daikon, which you, that's a, I'd call it a white reddish. That's, uh, or they cure them out in salt, uh, salt water or something. And uh, silkworms, that was our bacon. They're about, about that big. That's one stage of their life. I imagine they did their work and never what it is. I don't know. And uh, a little bit of soybeans. And uh, and cooked daikon. Let's see, how did we have that? I don't know whether we got the tops or breakfast, and then the daikon itself chopped up in chunks, three or four chunks of that in a soup for supper. Soybeans, if we just had enough of them, that would have got protein in them. You have to cook them for 24, 36 hours to get them kind of soft enough. When did you see the first American? I don't, well, I really don't, American soldier, you know, you, you mean a, that had came in. Yeah. I really don't know, but I think I saw one on a, standing on a uh, platform at a depot. That's the first thing I saw, and I, we didn't get, we didn't stop, we was on the train going to Yokohama. Okay, from the time the sergeant came in and said, there's no work today, take the rice to the galley until you're on the train to Yokohama, what did you do? Who ran the camp? The, uh, the Japs, they left. All but the, the interpreter, the old interpreter, he stayed. And I don't know whether the camp uh, uh, commander Oh, the officer, I don't know whether he stayed or not. How did the Japanese guards treat you there in Japan, the prison guards? Well, not too bad. They, they, they were just guards. I imagine their, their duties were to probably walk inside. That's the only trouble we had with them was inside. They'd be sitting at our door where the restroom was right there, and we had to get up all the way from three to seven, eight times, because our food was mostly in the water line, see? And you had to go to the bathroom. Well, you had to put on your clothes, just to go right here to just four or five steps to the bathroom. If you didn't, well, they'd make you stand at attention, the mosquitoes would eat you up. Oh, then. Sometimes you didn't have much time. You had to get there pretty quick. Then, most all of us was troubled with cramps, which 
which I think was the worms we had. That long. I passed two of them. And one old boy, he felt something in his throat. And he vomited it up, and he had two worms. He vomited them up, and he had them in a bottle. He was going to bring them home with him. I don't know what he had them in the water, but we didn't have no alcohol that I know of. But he vomited those up. And that may have been what gave us those cramps, you know, the There was, when I came back, I came back to the Philippine Islands. That's the way they brought us. From Yokohama to? Yokohama to Manila, out south of Manila. I don't know, I was messing around there, and an old boy was telling me, I didn't know him, about this group was on an island south of us. He said they run them in a cave and poured gasoline or something in there and set her on fire and it, it burned them all, except two, two lived through it. One of the, our company, our company commander at one time, the, the uh, Captain Brunning, he was down there and the old boy that used to be a, a buddy of mine when we was in the war part of it, he was down there. They, they both were killed down there, they burned. I thought he was a little bit this way, see. I came home. I got home. Uh, I hit San Francisco like in one day, being four years. What was your reaction when you hit San Francisco? Well, some of them screamed and hollered. Some of them cried when they went out of the bridge. We were all that way. Nuts. Starvation, you lose your mind. Okay. All you're looking for is food. I don't care where you are. Unloading coal, iron ore, regardless, you're looking for food. That's all things on your mind. If you came back to San Francisco, you're talking about the people that were burned in that cave? No. I don't know. I don't know where I was when he was telling me about it, but I thought he was a little bit nuts. But after I got home, I went. At that time, we had the outside, went out there, and I picked up a magazine and there it was. I read the whole deal down there. One of those islands south of Luzon. I don't know. Um. bitter for the Japanese? I hate them, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I don't have any use for them. Mm -hmm. I treat them all right, those that's here. I'm not around them. Thank God. When you heard about the bomb we dropped, what was your reaction? We didn't know nothing. I mean, when you finally heard about it, what happened? Oh. The only thing we heard was one bomb. Hiroshima first, I believe, and Nagasaki next. The first in Hiroshima, they said one bomb killed 90,000 people. Well, we couldn't believe it, you know, because we didn't know anything about it. But boy, when they hit Nagasaki right over there, right next to us. One bomb. The old interpreter, is he the one that told you the war was over? Well, no, those, um, those Japs down on the uh, guards down on the, that, 
the steel mill. They they tell the well they had all oh, fifteen eighteen men working here, and, but one of those uh, Jap guards said he told you something. You could better well believe it. So that's where you got the name that the war was. And there was either two or three outfits that came in, you know, all the different jobs that uh, since he's all over, well, we still couldn't believe it, but that's the first time we had seen those Japs listening to the radio there at that one place, they were right outside of the steel mill. They, they made steel, and made it big sheets. I never, I never worked in the But there weren't any Japanese left much in that, uh, around that mill. They, they did have a lot of laborers there when we first went there. But I think they'd taken them in service. Did, was that steel mill ever bombed by the Americans? No. Now right across the river, which is a very, water wouldn't be very deep unless the tide is in. I don't know what that was over there, a little, some of them said it was a little light plant of some kind, but it was, it's small. These pursuits, man, I'll tell you, it got to where the sky would be full of them pursuits going over, and I knew they weren't coming very far. You know, they don't go very far. And when they, I don't know where they went north of us, but when they come back, one of them pursuits took a shot at that little concrete building over there. That's the only action that we, re we really saw, you know, in daytime. But where I worked as the east end of the uh, steel mill, and there was an island, all oh, looked like 10, 12 miles, maybe a little farther back south and east of it, and you could hear the noise and the uh, I always, my opinion was, it's battleships. You can hear two, boom, then boom, then, and pretty soon you'd see smoke coming off of that island and along this water, see your ball across there. And I knew then, somebody's getting close. Because they had sure hammering that thing, they're getting ready to land there. As I've understood, now, I don't know. They sure hammered them. And there'd be usually two and maybe three of those B-29s would fly over and they'd always be to the west of us just a little bit. Let's see, was that... That is before they, they bombed Nagasaki. Usually three. Man, they'd be way up high, see? You see those streets, and then you can look out front and see them. They'd go north, but we never did see them. When they come, well, once or twice, maybe, they come back south, and they'd still be high. And we are, well, in a, my opinion, they'd probably be taking pictures. You know, they'd taking pictures of the whole shebang, and when they went right over that island, it, the, the artillery was hitting a little later. But they had, had that all pictured out. I don't know. Mm. After you got your discharge, where'd you go? I went back to my home down here. At 40. How close did that tornado come to you? Well, this, this night is down here about approximately five miles to six miles. So it missed you then? Yeah. I was, I was married then, living here in Chatham. Mm. Did you help the, when they brought the wounded to the hospital? Did you help out? I didn't know anything about it until the next morning. I worked for the state at that time, and we were ordered to go to Woodward, work on that bridge that goes up up to uh, Falling Springs. There used to be a wooden bridge there. It tore, what was it, 18 or 20 spans out of that bridge. Threw some of that 
direction and some in that direction. We worked there. And I didn't know it had hit Higgins. If it had if I'd have probably been there. I've got an uncle, you know, and roughly over there. I didn't know it had been there. So they tornadoed toward the bridge yet then? Yeah. Had the bridge across the river? Yeah. Yeah, it took out 18 or 20 spans of that. They had a wooden bridge in there at that time. I think they, I don't know whether they put in a new bridge there or not. I don't know, I don't remember. What did you do for the state? Work for the highway department? Yeah, on the end of the scoop show. I finally quit that. Got all that I wanted. I had all that scoop show I wanted. You know Judge Barry in Oklahoma City? William Barry? Well, he's a PW, isn't he? He was on Pregador. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. He, was, he was in Billabud. Billabud? Yeah, yeah. That's the old Federal Penitentiary. Well, anything else you want to talk about? Anything about your life in the prison camp? I've told you about all I can remember, all those probably things that. I'll tell you what, I had a friend here, he died. He was over there. You know, he wouldn't talk to anybody about that. Only me. He said they don't understand anyhow. And you know that's right. That's true. And you can't understand starvation until you've gone to I was going to ask you about hunger. What does it feel like? You lose your mind. Can you see of hunger, or was it? You're always hungry. You're looking for something to eat. You know, I've told you. <clears throat> always looking for something to eat. And to live in that place over there in Japan, those barracks were cold. We had two little coke burners, about that big around. They stood up. About so high, we had two for one of them long barracks. And it, uh, they don't build homes like they do over here. And where the rub come down, there was an open space right there. You know, they, they didn't close that. And well, air could come in, and you couldn't keep any heat in there. You couldn't get warm, that thing. That, that, that was, those stoves are about that thick, you know. That, they're really heavy. They get red hot. But you don't get no heat, you know. There's too many too many boys around right there. Did you when you came back, did the army give you any pay for being a PW? They gave me my thirty six dollars a month. That was what I was. I was a private fifth class. You don't make uh, you don't make anything in the uh, National Guard unless you're related to all the National Guard. I don't know whether you know how it works or not, but ninety percent of them are related. They're up in this little town, like Harrodsburg, Kentucky. There was in that vicinity. I think there was sixty some boys, and they're either brothers. We had. I don't know how many sets of brothers, and even related to their company commander. You don't make any, you know, in those deals. Then, of course, after you get to be a PW, you don't make any grades there at all. No, I was private fifth class, and when they, uh, what they did, oh yeah, when, when we got out of prison, they made, they advanced us one grade. I was a corporal, just trying to keep us in uniform, I think. Give us all those medals. <coughs> you don't eat those. You know, you start death eating those medals. I've got a bunch of them, but I haven't eaten one of them yet. But I didn't stay in the service either. Do you think the government knew Pearl Harbor was going to happen? I sure do. 
Eyes sure do. You think Roosevelt knew better? Eyes sure do. Well, how's it come? I'm going to ask you this. When we went up to Clark Field, when we first got there, right across the street north of us, was an anti-aircraft gun. And right beside it was a trench dug about, I imagine it's five or six foot deep. This way, and this way, and this way, zigzag, see? What was that doing out there? I used to wonder, what, what's that anti-aircraft gun doing out there? It's already set up. And that was in the 20th day of November, the 21st. That's the day that you can see around. We got there at night on November the 20th. No, yeah, they did it. And so the Japanese landed there in the Philippines. They were never, all those transports came in? Yeah, they never, well, they came in on the, the south end of the island, too. They landed down there. One of those Jap officers told them, <clears throat> one of the boys that I knew, he said, the, how did he say that? The Japanese is going to take <coughs> all the way down and Australia, then come into South America from the south. And Germany was supposed to come in from the north. That was his. I don't know where he got his information. He was a Jap officer of some kind. He wasn't too high. We had Japs over there to talk German better than the Germans can. That old interpreter we had, he had been in uh, Seattle, Spokane, Washington. Been there. And oh, old, uh, old Homa. The Japanese that greeted us when we went in the prison camp, he said, he I believe he said that in, he could talk English, but he said that in Japanese and he had an interpreter. He said, you are our enemies forever. Four years later, from the time the war started till it was over, they, they farm squad him. I've got his damn picture up there at home. Oh my hell, I need that. Yeah, you are our enemies forever. And he'd, be, he'd went to school in England, United States. I'll tell you what, we had one old boy in our outfit when we when we surrendered and we'd go into Mar Valley, we had got into a traffic jam. So we was sitting there in our trucks, and this one old boy got out and was messing around. He ran onto a Japanese in uniform that he went to school with in the United States. You see what they did? They'd send, the, they'd find out some of these old boys that went to college, Japs, and they promised them higher education if they come to Japan. They went to Japan, but they never did get the right back home. They wanted them for information, see? They thought maybe they'd know something. That... The only one I ever run on to, well, I'll tell you, they take your, if you had gold teeth, they come out. They wanted that gold. But the only Jap I saw that I know was an American, in my mind. The war was just, about over, or just before the end of it, I was going down the rail, walking down the railroad track, and he was going the opposite direction. Well, we didn't have a watch, so I said, uh, Imanaja Desca. He said, what did you say? <laughs> In English. <laughs> That's what time is it? That old boy, I'll bet you, was an American. He looked all up and down the track before he talked to me, see, because he knew that the 
Mother Japs knew him, you know, knew that he. And you know, that's the only time I ever saw that guy. Now, he had on a suit of clothes, dark suit, but uh, they hadn't been cleaned for some time, you know. They, I don't know whether they even got a cleaner over there or not at that time. But he was, uh, he was dressed up, he had on a you know, suit of clothes. And my name is Joe Todd, and this is an interview with Mr. Carl Root, R-U-F, R -U -F. in Shattuck, Oklahoma. Shattuck, Oklahoma. Sir, where were you born? I was born in Lehigh, Kansas. And when's your birthday? I was born in 1899. What month and day? December the 13th. Who was your father? My father's name was Fred Root. Fred Roof. And your mother? Annie Roof. What was her maiden name? Uh, maiden name was Kellen. How do you spell that? K-E-L-L-E-N. Okay. Where were your folks from? My folks uh, came from Schleswig Holstein, Germany, to Russia, to uh, a village they called Holstein. And that's where my father's father went to, but, and my folks were born in Russia. Did your folks ever tell you any stories about life in Russia? <laughs> they lived there all their life. <laughs> tell me but, what? But now if you want to know about Russia before the Bolshevism time, I can tell you that. I cannot tell you much about Bolshevism time, but we have people here and Shattuck that lived through it out there that are here now. I'd like to hear about Russia before. Before Bolshevism time. Yeah. Before Bolshevism time, uh, Russia was similar like little villages, and each village had a, had a, a fence around the village, uh, a sort of pretty near like the old Rome with a uh, fenced in. And at nights, uh, the gates were closed for instance, they had a street here, and each farmer, they were all farmers mostly, and only my father was, he was a farmer, and also he made uh, oaks yokes and made uh, wooden wheels for the wagons, but they don't figure on having steel axles, there was wooden axles too. And uh, whenever they had pins to the wood, and whenever you, they start squeaking or going a little heavy, you always had a, a, a bucket of grease with you when you went out to your acre. I'll explain that acreage later on. But uh, you, you take the wheel, and, and then they had a little pole there, and they'd lift that wheel up a little bit, and they put a little extra grease on that, and went on again. Very nicely. They didn't have no grease guns. What kind of house did your folks live in? Uh, uh, our ho home was um, uh, built out of, uh, uh, in Russia, it was built out of wood logs mostly. And some people had wooden uh, 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 dobies uh, in Russia, but uh, we didn't have no, uh, ours wasn't doby, but our first home in, in the United States or in uh, Oklahoma was doby house. No, I'll take it back. Our first house was a hole in the ground. So your father built wooden wheels in Russia? Yes, he built wheels and oaks yokes. You see, they, at that time they plowed mostly with oxen yet. Mm -hmm. What part of Russia did they come uh, from? Northeast of Stalingrad, uh, along the Volga River. It's around uh, Dovarenga, Mitrovka. Uh, if you want my uh, address, it was uh, Radoske, Gobena, Misinski, Odies, Rusland, uh, Rusland uh, Holstein, Rusland. 
You asked for it. <laughs> Tell us more about Russia before. Well, Russia, the queen from Russia, made an agreement with the Tsar, or with the Kaiser, it was before Kaiser was, I guess, and they, uh, they were cousins, and they made an agreement. If the German people come from Germany, different villages of Germany, come over and build up that nice land there along that Volga River, and they made an agreement that the boys would never have to uh, uh, be drafted into the Russian army. And that's the reason the German people went up there and farmed that land. Now, each son you got would get nine-tenths acres of a land, nine-tenths of an acre. If you got a girl, you got nothing. If you didn't have no boy, all you had was nine-tenths of an acre. You maybe could lease some land from old elderly people that couldn't work anymore, or uh, very little land there was to be sold unless somebody left. And they, uh, uh, my father had uh, uh, four boys when he left Holstein, Russia, so he had four acres, we'll call them nine-tenths, uh, just an acre. So uh, my father uh, inherited an acre from his father. So, and he had four boys, so they had five acres of land, it's all they owned in Russia. What made your parents decide to come to this country? <clears throat> That's easily answered, and it's a good thing. When this queen, or the uh, head lady in Russia died, and the new man took over, he took the, the German boys and made soldiers out of them, and generals and captains out of them, and wouldn't let them come back home. And therefore, all of the people that could barely have any connection with the outside world, like the United States, and could get out, they left that country, and they could get out if they had the ticket. So my mama's father sent us a ticket and got my father and his boys out and came to the United States. What year? Uh, it must have been in 18, uh, 1880, I'm not sure, five, six, no. Uh, see, I was born in 1890. No, I mean, uh, 99, 90s, uh, five, six, like that. See, see, let's see, uh, 1899, and they was about two or three years in Kansas before I was born. Mm -hmm. Did they ever talk about the trip to this country? Oh, yes. What'd they say about it? <laughs> How would you like to lay on a boat for months at a time before you can cross it? <laughs> And uh, imagine them boats only made about, oh, I don't know the speed, but it took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to come. Uh, uh, see, uh, my folks, my parents never seen Germany, only at the dock where they was unloaded to get on the ship. See, they took the ship from Germany over here. They had to go through Germany. Where'd they leave from? Uh, Holstein, Russia. No, in Germany, what port? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bremenhaven, I believe. So what about the boat trip? What happened on the boat? Oh, a lot of people died, but it was so poorly. It, it wasn't like now. Uh, How long did it take to cross? I don't know, but uh, I wasn't with them, but uh, it uh, is just, uh, when you're on water and don't see nothing but heaven and water, why, it, it's everlasting. Mm -hmm. and they, the boats, they didn't have uh, power like they have now and, and uh, go maybe 10, 15 knots. Did they land in New York? No, they landed at uh, Galveston. How come they went to Galveston? That I don't know, but that's, I guess the ticket showed Galveston and at Galveston, 
their ticket showed that they all they uh, my folks couldn't speak a word American. All they say Kansas. That's all they say Kansas. So they know they had uh, their ticket called for Kansas, and that's where they went to Lehigh, Kansas. And did your father farm in Kansas? No, uh, he worked out mostly, and the boys. Uh, the Dave and Fred and Adam and GF and Katie, there's five children already born. They worked out a little bit and, and uh, they uh, uh, stayed there till the strip opened here in Oklahoma and he come. My dad came down on the old railroad track and uh, he got out of the train about eight miles, seven and a half miles southwest of Shattuck here and the land uh, Man told him, the land agent really, told him, uh, and he could speak German. And he says, all right, get off of the train now and go pick up your land. And uh, by owning five acres of land in Russia, and uh, Dad, uh, uh, I guess, didn't know how big 160 acres was. Uh, you can compare five acres to 160 acres. So he stepped off of the train right down the railroad track here, and he got off, and the, when he said, pick out your land, he says, well, I'll just take this here. So when he said, uh, take this here, he gave him a board about that long and about that wide, and he says, put your name on it. Well, my dad couldn't write the American, so he put an X there, and Mr. John Longhoover he was uh, here uh, in Kansas a while already, and he says, uh, we'll just put the Friedrich Ruf on there. And that's all that was put on that board. When it was all surveyed out, we found out that part of our land here, the railroad cut through here, and part of it was here, and part of it was here. So he got part of the uh, east side of the railroad. How did, where did he file on the land? Seven miles southwest of Shattuck. And where was the land office? The land office was at Woodard at that time. Okay. How long did it take to prove up on the land? Oh, not very long. Mm -hmm. Not very long because, you see, he, they came down uh, already in May. See, uh, uh, this was happened about uh, 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 latter part of the summer, and in May we already moved down here. Dug us a hole in the ground. Dug out. Oh yeah, dug out. No, no sides to it. We just made a hole and got a, there's a lot of trees and and uh, in the rock creek and in the long creek and the wolf creek, and we just cut timbers and laid them across and put grass all over the top. Big, there's high grass and and we just throw dirt on top of that to hold it down. And, and uh, that's where we were. three families lived in one dugout. And uh, then uh, from there we went out and, uh, and found the right uh, soil with a little clay in it and made us forms about uh, eight inches by 12 inches, uh, maybe 14 inches. And we made our forms and we took grass and mixed that up with that clay and made us bricks. And that was our adobe bricks and we built us. us each one a house. They went from place to place and we built each one a house. Now three families lived in one dugout? Yeah, that's all. Where else should they be? They couldn't. How big was the dugout? Oh, I I was only three, about four or five months old now. Watch out, you're getting me <laughs> down in my bare feet. But it wasn't very big and it, uh, we, they built our dugout first. And uh, so it didn't take too long. Of course, it took a little bit for them uh, for them dobies to dry and to lay them up, but they didn't take very long. I don't think I, I can uh, specify the time it just took. But uh, about uh, <coughs> this happened in in nineteen in nineteen one in May, June, July, or some ten months. I was I was there, but I, I didn't keep book at that time. <laughs> I was only, what, about four or five months old. But anyhow, 
they went from place to place. They built ours, and then Adam Benders, and then Myers, and then then Bushes, and then Steinfelds, and all around. They were brother-in-laws, or in-laws, or by-laws, and they just built each one an adobe house. How big was the adobe house he lived in? Uh, our adobe house was two rooms. Uh, our, uh, we had a, uh, a kitchen and then one big uh, back room. We didn't have no dining room. Kitchen was always the dining room. But uh, there was a, a bedroom and uh, the bedroom was one big room, but they had sort of a curtain in between it or something like that. But uh, the boys, my older brothers, they slept at in a granary. They built a granary out of wood, and uh, uh, they slept on uh, that had a little upstairs, and they slept there uh, in that granary. Mm -hmm. Did you have much trouble with the rain and on the adobe? Oh, I don't remember having it. It rained hard sometimes later on, of course. We've had big rains here. Uh, you must remember our ground was a lot of pastures and sod, and we had a lot of buffalo wallows. We didn't have no ponds. We had a lot of uh, washed out holes, and uh, no terracing and nothing, and then, uh, uh, the land was plowed up and washed away, and, and uh, see, we had these sulky plows, and you'd go around and around and around, and then you plow out the corners, and if the corners was plowed out, where the far as was it wash out and go down the line here and wash out there. We roamed our land because we didn't know any better. No equipment to terrace, no ponds was built, only <coughs> the people did have these little slips or the frizz nose, uh, which is a scraper and we build little ponds in the pasture for the cattle that uh, have water, like where the railroad track cut across our land. We had a pasture on this side, we built a pond there and a little draw, and we gathered water in there. No pond, not ponds like they build now. What kind of crops did you raise on the farm? Well, we raised wheat, maize, kaffir corn, and uh, grohoma, and uh, we really, uh, they raised corn. Now, I can swear to that because when my folks went out to chop the corn off, uh, I went along, and uh, uh, I guess I got tired and I sat down. It was a nice clean place, and I sat down, and before I knew it, it was an ant pile. <laughs> and Mom, I guess, came back and found the ants crawling all over me. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> You're taking all of that. <laughs> That's true. But, uh, <laughs> what chores did you do in the farm? Our chores were, uh, uh, I was uh, the first boy born, you know, and the older boys, they, uh, they had, each one had a, uh, later on had a team of horses. And my brothers, they broke out a lot of land for other people with their sod plows. Now, I guess you've got a description of sod plows. They was not like our silky plows or other plows. They was, uh, had strips of uh, iron where it turned the sod over, and there was only 12 inches. And uh, uh, on the front of the tip of the shear here, <coughs> there's a blade come up about that high. <coughs> that would cut your sod, you know, and then turn it over. And you walk behind it. No, uh, no riding gloves. <coughs> <coughs> How many acres of sod could you break out in one day? Oh man! <laughs> now wait a minute. You're born in the wrong time. Uh, I imagine. I imagine it took a good day to plow an acre with a 12 inch, and it took a good long day. Did you, do you prefer to plow with horses or mules? Well, we had both of them. We had both of them. We raced horses, and uh, we had uh, only 
Well, we had more than two teams. Each one of my older brothers had a mules, uh, big mules, not no, I mean big mules, uh, uh, around uh, 1,800 pounds apiece. And they, I say this much, a mule will outwork a horse. And uh, they're tougher than a horse. So you, you prefer the mules? No, I I think a mule is stubborner than a horse, but I wouldn't say I, I'd rather have a, a good horse. And I was raised up. I was a horse trader. I was a horse breaker, and and I rode a lot of. I think I rode horse before I could walk. What did you start to school? I start to school at uh, at uh, New Goodman. The little town sprung up <coughs> in 1908. The railroad track was changed to a half a mile east from the old track. And on our farm was a town started with name New Goodman. We first wanted to call it Holstein, but the railroad company had a little town southwest of us about four miles and it, they called it Goodwin. So when the railroad track changed, they changed, they, we want to change the name, but the Santa Fe says, well, why not just call it New Goodwin and leave the old Goodwin over there? They took that track up anyhow, and so they abolished uh, later on the old Goodwin and called it New Goodwin, and it's still there. There's a two-mile crossing and our home and everything's still there. Our first home we built out of wood was in 1908 or 9, and it's there yet. I rebuilt it. I rebuilt it and remodeled everything in 1938 on. I, I moved to the home place and rebuilt the whole home place. How big was the school you started to? Uh, well, we just had one room, and I'd say we had maybe. And 15 children there. Could you speak English when you started? Uh, I'll answer that this way. If your father and mother couldn't talk Russian and didn't know nothing but Volga or German, how would I speak English? <laughs> no, we didn't speak English, although uh, we had a, a family with name Colander that came up here from Beaumont, Texas, <coughs> and they they, uh, they were German. But they was clothed, a different German than we, but they could understand us. And if we wanted anything, they translated it for us to begin with. How did you learn English? By going to school. Did the teacher teach you English? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Sure, my folks couldn't read nor write English. Yet, my mama was a, a, a German teacher in Russia, but my folks couldn't speak Russia. But I can. I can count to ten. Раз, два, три, родица, бед, зем, боже, ты. Он сва, три, фи, фен, сек, си, ват, на, се. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Did the kids in school ever make fun of you for speaking German? Which kids? What kids? The ones that spoke English. There was none there. There was all German. Oh, they were all German. Well, yes, oh. only the teacher was American. <laughs> well, how did the and she learned German. Well, how did the <laughs> <laughs> Watch it. When you are in a German district where there's not an American family there, how are you going <laughs> to... If the teacher neither got to learn or you got to learn. All right, the teacher had to learn with us so that we know what we wanted. So you and taught her German, she taught you English? Oh, yes, she got so that the little children come up and, and talk her, tell her in German, I got to go to the restroom, and, and you know how the restrooms were out the previous way out there. And they'd go and tell her. And if, they, if the teacher didn't understand it, she'd ask one of the older students, that uh, like the Colander boys, what does she want? And then this person would tell the Colander children, and then the Colander children. Uh, our first teacher, 
His name was Friedrich Ulich. He was a man from Germany that stored away, but he was a smart guy, and he learned American and taught American classes here at Chattic. So, like uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Uli or uh, Mr. Uh, our hardware store man, he uh, he had a he couldn't understand the German people when they wanted something, so he took a lesson from him so that when you want some nails or spikes or sixteen penny nails or whatever you wanted, so he could understand you. He took lessons from this from my first teacher. What was the lady's name that you taught German to? What was her name? That I taught, oh, that was Belly Moorhead from Arnett. She, uh, she, uh, she picked it up about as fast as, as we expected her to. <laughs> but uh, she done that mostly, she done that mostly on account of the little, the beginners. See, at that time when Belly Moorhead was a teacher, we all could speak the American. And we had teachers where you was not allowed to speak one word German on the school ground. But you know how that goes. If you had something to say to one that wouldn't understand you, what well, you'd whisper in the ears. And of course they, if you got caught, what happened? Well, they didn't like it. <laughs> but uh, uh, the people, it didn't take too long till. Uh, Till we spoke American on the school grounds and, and a lot between us. And, and my mama learned to read, write quick. She was a, a, a quick uh, learner. And she, uh, the time, uh, time I got out of school or got up to the 10th, 11th grade, why well, she could read a uh, print, the American print over. Do you remember the Depression of 1907? 1907? <coughs> well, I'll tell you, in 1907, there wasn't much here. See, in, in 1908, in 1909, this when they changed the railroad track, and uh, we had, I don't know whether there was uh, any, if you ask me whether I know, remember the sandstorm or the dust bowl, I'd, I'd answer that different. But see, I was only seven years old. It was in 1907. And, uh, you remember statehood? When we joined the Union, Oklahoma? Now, let's see, I don't know which year it was. It was 1907, again. Let's see. And that, uh, pretty hard to remember. There wasn't much going on here. We already had our land and our houses. I, yeah, I think it was in 1967 or 8 when we built our first home out there, our big home. Did you have a drilled well or a dug well? We had a dug well. Now, now you're getting down, and it was 25 foot deep. And I can still show you where it was. Who dug it? Uh, Mr. Spomer, Conrad Spomer. He was a strong man, and he was the, uh, his, uh, his uh, wife was a, uh, his children are the children to my first wife. They, he was a, a man came from uh, from uh, across the Volga River, Dreispitz, and he came over here. And he was a good digger. He was a heavy, short man, and uh, he's strong. And he would dug a lot of uh, dug wells around here. Twenty-five feet, not very deep for a well. No, right? it wasn't, but we had a lot of water there, and. Uh, the well that's out on the farm now, right now, I've got water uh, at uh, about 30 foot down. Is uh, the water level starts at 30 foot, although my well is over 80 foot deep. But I've got an open bottom well out there with electric pump on it. Is it good water? You bet you like the best in the United States. Shattuck's got the best water in the United States. And if you don't believe it, you better try it, Mister. I've been there around quite a little. Mm -hmm. World War One. All right, I didn't. I haven't. Did not belong to none of them. In 1918, when the war quit, I was ready to get on the train and go to the camp. 
and the train pulls in and says, go home. What did you do in Armistice Day? When it quit, mm -hmm. I was working with my brother raising sugar beets at Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. What were you doing up there? Raising sugar beets. Mm -hmm. So your brother lived in Nebraska? Yeah, my oldest brother. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the revolution in Russia? You mean what's there now, or what was there in the Bolshevism time? Bolshevism. It's, it was mean. They killed everybody. They killed our whole relationship and starved them to death. All the Germans that were there? All the Germans were there. It was driven out and killed and, and just starved. Some of them, they made it as far as to water, and there some of them got across even. Uh, but, uh, a lot of them died on the way, and that's Russia for you. And I was—I wasn't born there. That's as Russia is. Uh, you must remember, all of them villages I uh, named you down are German people mostly, and uh, they—they uh, all uh, originated out of Germany, and they built up that country there. But we had the Gargis. That's an Indian tribe. They stole cattle and they stole horses. And uh, we had a lot of trouble with them. What were they called? Gargis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, we had uh, people right here. There's some people here living in Shattuck. Their grandfather was our, our, uh, our woods uh, marshal. And he took care of, see, there was no fences. and. Uh, the horses, they just had hobbles on the front legs. And uh, they was out there, and he watched them. And he was a very strong man, and if he caught them, he just busted their heads. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So then all the Germans were, I guess, they all left. They all what was able to get out of Russia got out when the Bolshevism started. Mm -hmm. but. They had good life over there while everything worked fine. There was a, that's rich soil along that Volga River, and they raised good crops. And they started, they already started farming with horses and things like that. Things, uh, uh, they even, uh, they even already, uh, they, you know, they all cut their wheat with the scythe and uh, tied it with the, with the strings of the wheat string. Uh, or part of the wheat, they just got it together and used it for twine to make bundles. And, uh, but uh, the time my folks left already, that they already had a, <coughs> a drawing, uh, something like with a, a pitman on and a sickle and a reel, and they had two horses pulling this thing, and uh, it was driven uh, with the wheels that was on it to uh, work the sickle and they'd throw it on there, and you'd rake it off, and then rake it off, and the other people would come and tie it in the bundles. I was all ready before we left, uh, uh, my folks left Russia. Um, was there any hard feelings against Germans during World War I around here? Well, several of them got hung on the on the, on the, I was taken up. One of the, only one of them that I knew, they had a wagon tongue and they put the neck yoke under the wagon tongue and wanted to hang him, but they didn't get the job done. There was a nut whip that got the high head. And he come here and he wanted to kill all of the Germans. And, and you see, this man, Uli, he had, uh, he sold pictures, nice uh, photographs from the Russian Tsar and the Kaiser from, uh, from uh, Germany. And, and they were nice pictures. The whole families were on there. And any German that had one of them pictures or anything, why well, he grabbed them and throw them in jail and wanted to kill them. Well, uh, the way I told you before, our land agent our uh, land headquarters were at uh, Woodard, and when he brought these German people up to Woodard, and uh, 
and uh, he told the, the men that were there what they what they've done and what they are. And they said he said they was praying to him, and that was a lie because my folks they believe in God; they don't believe in pictures. And uh, uh, my folks were seventy Advents in Russia already, and we had a lot of Lutheran here. We had Baptists. We had them of all walks alive here, and. Uh, the land agent over there, and he says, what are you bringing them in over here for? Well, so and so and so. He says, uh, Mr. Roof, how many bonds did you buy? Mr. Ehrlich, how many bonds did you buy? And there was Mr. Mr. Uh, 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 let's see, I was going to name uh, Mr. Fritzler. How many did you buy? And they was all up there. They was all going to high string them. And they told them how many bonds they bought to keep this all going, you know. And uh, then he turned around and he says, I want to know how many bonds did you buy? He said, none. He says, we're going to tell you something. The quicker you can get out of here and let these people alone, you can save your neck. If not, I'm going to put you in. Now that's true. That's just the way it happened. I don't know whether anybody told you that, but that's the way it happened. So I was here. Yes, the German people was uh, uh, the American. Uh, my father had to leave the Shattuck Bank and do banking at Higgins because some of our bankers here got the big head. A lot of people left the shadow bank. They, they came, all came back then. They don't know. I do. I know all the bankers. I've been with them. I was ten years old when I borrowed my first uh, mon uh, money from uh, Ned Stewart's father's father. Now, uh, don't have it right. <laughs> don't have. Don't like. 1920s and 1930s. Uh oh. In 1928, I went out to Delhart and bought several sections of land. In 1933, I came back with a, an old whippet car and a two wheel trailer and one, two, three, five little girls. Lost everything I had. How'd you lose it? They blew it away, borrowed money, bought a tractor. To race row crop, I had a wheat land tractor. I raised wheat. I had piles of wheat laying there, 15 cents a bushel. I had a combine. Went out with combines and everything. I had everything going out. Come back with an old wheel, a car, and a two wheel trailer. That's about the quickest story to answer that. One. And I worked on the WPA then. Doing what? Shoveling dirt. Around right here. Right. I, mean, I helped build that 283, clear off north. What was your salary in the WPA? I forgot. It. I thought it was two dollars and seventy cents a day. Mm -hmm. I forgot. It. It somewhere in that area. How come all this land blew away? First of all, we didn't raise nothing. And whenever you've got sandstorms and you haven't got nothing to cover your ground, off it goes. And uh, the Dale Hart, we had, uh, we just didn't get no rain and it started blowing and we, we didn't raise, it didn't rain at all in the morning, it just blowed and blowed and blowed. We had our children at night, we, uh, in the beds they slept, we had to have a wet sheet hanging on the posts of the bed to keep from dust settling in on them. The sheets had to be washed every day. And we only had uh, a few hours at a time where we had a little break. Otherwise, every day and every day dust storm. Were you and Del Hart when Black Sunday hit? Uh, I was right here when Black Sunday hit. I was out here uh, five miles south and a mile uh, east digging a grave for my father-in-law when the Sunday a dust storm hit. Tell me about that dust storm. You 
want me to tell you a lie or the truth? The truth. Well, everybody that didn't get inside of a car or inside of something to cover up, the best thing is if you had a coat, just wrap it around your head so no dirt can get in and lay down flat on the ground. And if you didn't, you smothered the death. You couldn't see a thing. You had to have lights, the cool oil lamps were then, and we, they had the lights on in the house, otherwise it was pitch dark. So, but it didn't last two, I guess about two hours. What did that death storm look like when it was approaching? Well, I thought it was the end of the world, that's what I thought. It was just rolled in from the north. It just rolled in here from Dodge City, that black soil, and it just rolled like a, a great big, way worse than a tornado or, or anything like that. It, it covered the whole world. As far as I could see, it was all the same blackness, the same thing. No sun, no nothing. Beautiful. I don't want to see another one. <laughs> yeah, I was here. You do any work with the CCC? Huh? Did you do any work with the CCC program? No. No, what you mean uh, for the... Savannah so Conservation Corps. No, I had all... Uh, I, all I'd done is build terraces. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd be, see, for a, I built a lot of my own terraces with that with a big tumble bug, you know, and I had a big Minneapolis tractor. When, when, as soon as uh, uh, I started out and took the farms over at home in 1938, I built my own terraces. I surveyed my own terraces. Now there's something, if I tell you that, you'd laugh at me, but I'm going to tell you, you don't have to write it down yet. I took, I and my oldest boy, I didn't have a boy until 1936, the rest of them was all girls. But when he got a little older, we had a five-gallon cream can, and I took a, a, a six, put a, one of my cousins is out there, he wants to come in. But we, I put that level on, and I let him go so far, and I, as long as I could see him, and I leveled out, and I built my terrace, and they're still there today. There's terraces there, when the sea rare came out, Later on, when we had other terraces built, he says they are as good as I can lay them out. How do you know there. how to build them? I've done a lot of things in my life. I was an engineer. I was a Minneapolis troubleshooter. I worked for the Minneapolis company. I've done a lot of things. What did you do in World War II? Let's see, what year? 41 to 45. Uh, uh, 41, I was already at the home place there farming. Yeah. You do any work to support the war effort in the Second World War? Mm, not in the war. Not in the. You mean uh, whether I was a. Be more specific on that. Uh, you mean whether I had anything to do as a. As a uh, getting boys into the army? Yeah. Or that, no. No, I only had one boy. My oldest boy, he served in the Army, but he never went across. Okay. What about the tornado, 1947? <sighs> all right. The east quarter, it took the windmill and all of the fences and rolled them up. The south quarter, it took that and rolled them all up. At home, at the home place, it took out, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about a combine there, but it took out the evil and took the evil and threw it out in the pasture, and that's all. But on my place. But all of my neighbors was damaged and cattle killed and, and barrels wrapped around fence, uh, telephone poles and, and uh, uh, oh, all kinds of queer things. And we, for a year or two, we helped one another out, go from farmer to farmer and help out build, rebuild. And uh, all of the children was out picking up wood and nails and stuff because the wheat was already that high. And we had to get them boards out of there. You couldn't uh, combine or do anything. How close did that tornado come to your house? Well, let's see. The closest place was a half a mile. 
the closest harm, uh, the closest home I tore up was within a half a mile. But it tore two of my farms up. Yeah. Did you see it go by? Oh, sure. What did it look like? <laughs> I seen several of them. That that big one. That big seven. one. That big one had thirteen tails. And it was uh, 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 two, three, two miles south of Shattuck, and take it clear down to Podunk. And they counted 13 tails that went northeast. 